Welcome to another edition of Startup Stories, the monthly chat with entrepreneurs about their journey, challenges, and experiences. My name is Rachel, and I'll be your host today. We're back at Studio Start in Leuven, and for the people following online as well, um, if you have any questions, pop them on Discord. We've got them on the screen here, and then uh, we'll cover them at the end, and the same for the people um, here in the studio. My first guest speaker is Bert Knappen, the co-founder of My Game Plan. My Game Plan is a startup based in Leuven that focuses on developing a platform to transform complex football data into actionable visuals, which is primarily targeted at professional football clubs that maybe don't have enough money for their own data science team. And um, my game plan doesn't require significant inputting information and lots of data. It actually just needs only a minute uh, each week to generate the data visuals. Yeah. Um, and then through player app football, players can obtain um, data visuals that highlight certain strengths and patterns in their next opponent. Is that? It's, it's like you're a co-founder. There we so. go. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to quickly introduce Leah as well, our second speaker, Leah Sophie Sur, the co-founder and trainer at Talent Interlock. Talent Interlock is a startup also based in Leuven that provides business skill training for international talents in Belgium. Um, Belgium needs over a million highly skilled workers over the next few years, in which the existing talent pool would not be enough to meet this demand. So along with the influx of foreign nationals, Belgium gains access to a growing pool of qualified knowledge workers, bringing global experience and fresh ideas to the Belgian workplace. And Talent Interlock specializes in nurturing these new international talents with customized training and integration programs to get them ready for the Bel Belgian professional market. And Leah was just telling me they've also started dual career services. Um, Leah, maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about this specifically. Sure. If we start right there, of course. So if a couple, and that happens increasingly often in times of global mobility, if a couple moves to a new place, a new city, a new country due to one partner's job, the other partner usually is also highly skilled and intends to continue his or her own career as well at the new place. So dual career services often provided by the employer, so that could be a company, could be university, focuses on providing then support, guidance, information for the job search of that highly skilled partner. Oh, okay, super. Really interesting. Um, but then... Maybe a bit interested to go back already and have a look at like how you got into this role and how into ta ta into um, interlock. Um, what's your professional background? How did the idea come about for this? Yeah, my professional background is in politics. I worked in Berlin. I'm from Germany originally. I worked in Berlin for political startups for a couple of years before I left behind my own job to do exactly that, follow my partner to Belgium as he started a new position here in Leuven. I asked my husband's employer for dual career services. A couple of years ago, four or five years ago, non, no such services existed here in Leuven. Um, however, a couple of weeks, months later, I was approached um, to participate in a pilot dual career program. That's where I met my now colleague and co-founder Nicole, Nicole Videl von Leupold. So she designed that program, she ho um, was holding that program. We met, she as a trainer, I as a participant, and we, we just really got, ta got to talk a lot. We talked a lot, we talked some more, and really had the feeling there's more in that topic, there's more to that, we need to do something with that, there's really a need. Also just because Leuven is such an international city. So you have the university, you have IMEC, you have AB InBev, other companies who are, which are hiring internationally. So there's a constant influx of internationals coming to Leuven, many of them coming with their partner, some with their family. So we felt immediately that there are more people who have the same need as Nicole and I had when we both moved to Leuven in the first place mm. and that's yeah that's how the idea started that's how talent interlock started nice so i'm really experiencing something seeing that something didn't exist seeing an opportunity and, and seizing that cool um 
how did then uh, my gay plan come about? I'm wondering, is, is it also from some kind of a missing need that then it, it came about? Um, yeah, pretty much. I was, I was working at, at OHL at that time, like the professional football team here in Leuven, and I was more responsible that time for the data strategy um, at that moment. And yeah, I was seeing at the club, but both at our clubs on Belgium level and European level that the usage of data on tactical purposes was really at a low level, inefficient. It was a new wave that came out of data scouting and, and sports betting that the data was generated. And yeah, I saw it with, with our own team. Um, it was taken over or acquired by, by Leicester City, like a big team in England, and they, they brought their exp expertise to the club. But I saw that in other teams and, and rather like smaller teams with not a lot of finances, that there was no data scientist or no data science team. So yeah, I, I got in contact with someone who is now a co-founder who I went to high school with. He was more with a technical background and yeah, we came together with, with then the third co-founder, Milan, who is more a data scientist to the idea of creating a SaaS and bringing the data and the insights to the players directly. So not only the coaches, but the, the players. Mm -hmm. And we started talking with, with different kind of people with a lot of more expertise than us three who were working in football for years. And they all said, yeah, it's a good idea. Just go ahead with it and start. And that's how we jumped. Nice. Cool. Um, was it for you something, So, was it completely unplanned? Did you think like when you were younger, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to work for myself or um, just opportunity? It, it, I always think for myself that it came pretty late. But when I talk to my surrounding people, they say it was not that late. I, I experienced it during like the coronavirus that I had like one idea after the other and it just came like that. And I, I don't know, I began talking to people who had been entrepreneurs and who had um, looked into their own stories and, and, and experienced their own startups. And um, I always was waiting until the right ID came about. And I thought at that moment, this is the right ID. Now we have to jump. And then, yeah, uh, we got a couple of, of grants. We got into started at KBC, I'm a guy start. And then it was just easy for us to, um, easier to jump and just leave our jobs behind and, and go for the journey. But it was not like that I was selling lemonade when I was young or something. I was totally not like selling stuff. Um, it became like around my 21, 22 that all of a sudden it happened. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting to find out. And for you, Leah, was it a similar story or also something that you really thought about where before? Not at all, actually. I have a completely different professional background. So starting, starting my own idea, our own idea was something completely new, but I enjoy it tremendously. So um, I think it's definitely the right path. And uh, yeah, it took me by surprise, but yeah, yeah, I am. Nice. Um, is there anything that you now love the most about being an entrepreneur that get yeah, really attracted to this, that's a drive, I want to keep doing it? I think it's really putting ideas into practice so that you really can take your own ideas and drive this forward and put that into practice. I think that's really fascinating and also that in most cases you really immediately also see an impact of what you're doing. So in our case we see an impact of what we're doing here in the community in Leuven and we often, of course, get feedback of participants of our workshops, our webinars, our trainings. So, I mean, it really makes my day in the end if, if someone really says, okay, that really impacted my job search here in Belgium in a positive way. And now I can really see a future for myself here in Leuven, here in Belgium. Um, now I can imagine to stay so that, yeah, it's just, just great to see that impact. And on top of that, I would say um, it gives me a lot of autonomy, flexibility what was also much needed when working while having very small kids and then also um, a pandemic on top of it. So, um, yeah, so yeah. I'd say um, that's, yeah, a lot of things I actually like. And in our case, if it's when it's such a good match also to develop your ideas together with your co-founder and to really drive that forward together. Yeah, nice. And on the other side, what are the biggest challenges <laughs> that of being an entrepreneur? Mm, I'd say... Um, one of the big challenges is that you always need to do everything by yourself or, of course, in the team you have, or then connect to others who bring that expertise or those skills you don't have in the core team. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a challenge, but it can also really mean a steep and also continued learning curve. 
Um, but I'd say this is one of the challenges. Of course, you have much less security and stability compared to being employed. And um, you're never really off. I mean, that's a cliche, but it definitely holds true that also in, yeah, not even on holidays, you're really off, off, but you always constantly have things going on in your mind about um, what's the next idea and how did that process end up and what's that leading to, what's next, and um, yeah, or just still answering emails. Yeah. Beth and you kind of really agreeing yeah, strongly on that. Yeah, agree on that. On that. <laughs> um, switching off part, I think you're always thinking about how to improve, how to take the next step, but also there is like an uncertainty that all of a sudden something can happen that really has an impact on your company and on, on, on your also your co-founders. Because we co-founded with three, but I came with the crazy idea and I, I, I don't I slipped them out of their job. So I always feel a little bit responsible also that that if something goes wrong, that I took them out. I mean, we had a, we, if it stops now, we had a great adventure, of course. Yeah. But yeah, it still have the responsibility you have over your team and, and over like, if you, put, if you take your first hire, for example, it's different. And, and that switching off part is, I think, the, the biggest for me, I wouldn't say negative, but something you have to, biggest difference with being an employee and being in a corporate or something, you just, you go home, and sometimes you have to think about tasks, but if you're on holiday or on holiday, you switch off and you have nothing to think about. But that's a little bit different. But for me, it also has like a lot of upsides that are way, way much, maybe way more than the, than the downside of yeah. not switching off. It's maybe a bit of a cliche image though of, I have also been in, employed for a long time and I'm not able to switch off on holiday. <laughs> I don't know about other people, but just, I guess it depends on your mentality. But I agree on that too. If you're employed and you really like what you're doing there, you also still have new ideas yeah. and still yeah. going on about yeah, it's true. What, what you're doing. Yeah. So I can, I can see that point too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going further into um, my game plan. Um, so um, was there something specific that made you decide to go into the field of data sciences and specifically sports um. um yeah i think it's just because we all three of us just are crazy about sports and and yeah football in, in particular um we just like to do it um we we see the future of data science in general in the world but also in in the world of football i think it came into the world of football with with data scouting like doing transfers with using data and now it's enrolling a little bit more in utilizing it in your day-to-day -day work and so it's just, um, yeah, it's not been exploited for the slightest in, in sports. Uh, you have now fan engagement, um, everything to do with data, the betting industry, but also the moment that you can just put a camera next to a sporting field and with computer vision track data of an amateur game, that's yeah. the moment that it will really explode. And then you also have like data availability for amateur sports that you can track like you do now with Strava when you run all your activities. And that's the moment we just want to prepare for as my game plan. Okay, cool. Um, are you consciously developing the culture within my game plan in the business? Uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, because yeah, all the time, you're just going from deadline to deadline. And I think we are three co-founders who really are on the same spot. Mm -hmm. um, like we're complementary, like think thinking different in some ways, but what culture of the company we want to be when we, when we grow further is like on one line without we have saying, having to say a word. Yeah. Like we did our first hire in, in February and we were just talking like, I think I planned a meeting for it like two, three hours, like how are we gonna envision our, the vision of the company, how are we gonna say it to this new employee? And it was a meeting of like 10 minutes because we were all agreeing on, yeah, we want to be, yeah, it's, some, it's, it's kind of cliche, like we want to be open and we want to be no, no roles, etc. But it was just like so obvious that I never had the feeling that we have to like install a culture or something, mm -hmm. but at the moment I think everything is really open. Like um, sometimes, like because Milan is from the Netherlands, we work remote and he's not in Leuven. It works really well, and I 
I'm curious how it will grow when we have like multiple employees, but uh, I hope we can have the same atmosphere that we have right now yeah. in the company. Yeah. How do you ensure that you find people that have the same values and yeah. it's going to be it's difficult nice to for, because we need a lot of uh, software uh, developers. First, it's it's difficult part is just to find one. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, same values. I think, I don't know if... I think you, you can see it pretty soon in your like your first conversation that if he carries the same values um, and then we try to yeah, have a lot of informal conversations and see if there is a fit like we had it with the employee right now. We had, I think, six, five or six conversations before hiring him, mm -hmm. just informal and just getting to know each other and see if he thinks the same way and just by asking like informal questions about what do you value in your in your when you're not working or something you get a lot of information out of it and then you can make like a decision like is he a fit in the team would he in three years still be a fit would he be available to be an add-on on the core team for example one day and we had a really good feeling about it and yeah that's why we made the decision with him but mm -hmm. yeah i would just suggest like talk informally with a beer or with an activity with someone you want to hire and i think that's the best example of of knowing who or not and who you do hire mm -hmm. okay that's good advice um so you, i heard you say there's um you're looking for software developers yeah, all the time yeah i know <laughs> i've heard this very often that this is a big issue at the moment yeah um but is there any like specific project then that you're working on yeah we're, we're developing uh SaaS, um platforms for web platform for the coaches and, and a web application for the players so we're developing all the time i think okay. uh, on the roadmap it's still for the next two years going on and we'll be won't be finished after that mm -hmm. um, i'm gonna drop another cliche software is never finished mm -hmm. um, so yeah i think we'll need them forever if we exist yeah and is are there any other big challenges next to yeah a lot um <laughs> <laughs> no i think um yeah hiring wise or just company wise the biggest challenge is um that the window of opportunity now for selling to a football team is pretty pretty small because during the season, it's difficult to change workflow at a team or at right. a club. And the season is finished um, in now, in May, starting of June. Then they're on holiday. And then you have like two, three months to make a new sale and to, to sign a new partnership. Okay. And having such a small window of opportunity with clubs makes it a really important period in time. Yeah. But also really difficult because you have no room for error. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's the biggest bottleneck or biggest insecurity we have. Yeah. in our business plan yeah sounds tricky indeed <laughs> okay going over to talent interlock um curious to know so obviously you're targeted at uh international people coming to Leuven. are there is within that a, a specific a further definition or specification um and how do you get to in contact with them we first really started out with expat partners accompanying partners so really focusing on dual career services what i just described so partners are yeah a couple moving to live in for the job of one partner and the other one is highly skilled highly qualified and wants to work as well so those this has been the situation nicole and i have been into ourselves so expat partners were our really core target group but it has really grown from that. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish because expat partners experience very similar challenges compared to internationals, highly skilled internationals coming to Leuven, coming to Belgium, or just wanting to stay in Leuven. Also international graduates from the university who intend to stay. So if they want to enter the job market, the challenges are very similar. And it also depends totally on our clients, which are usually public institutions. So then, of course, we also go with whatever target group they define. So sometimes mm. they really want to offer a straightforward dual career program, really targeted to the partners. Sometimes they offer something, a webinar, um, career guidance, what have you, for internationals in general. So this can be both, but this is really... Um, yeah, so the target group has definitely grown. Yeah. And how we get in touch with them, 
I mean, we also do, of course, general social media marketing. Um, we have been writing project proposals um, for grants, also, um, also addressing public institutions. But it has also been here in Leuven a lot through, um, at least in the beginning, through yeah, word to mouth and our personal connections. Because we are living in an international place, um, so there are a lot of other internationals we know and we have constantly come in touch with. So this has also grown through that. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things, but also then through LinkedIn, because we're connecting with other, other professionals offering dual career services, for example, in the Nordic countries. So this is quite big over there as well. Um, so it has also been through LinkedIn that we acquired projects and new clients, actually. Mm -hmm. So a mix, I would say. So it's probably also good not to have only one stream, but really different um, streams of how you get in touch with clients. Yeah, okay. And you said there was no other um, company offering the services. Have you seen anything that you think are similar, but still you're differentiating yourself in a certain way, or you're already now conscious perhaps of possible competitors in the future and focusing on how you're differentiating yourself? You mean in Leuven or globally or? In Leuven specifically. Um, not really actually, no, no okay. not really. Yeah. Um, but did you have then any struggles in establishing uh, Talent Interlock as a product? Mm, of course, it took us a while to really create a steady stream of inf income, obviously, as for many in the same situation. I would also say that the whole concept of dual career was not so well known a couple of years ago as we started. So it was rather a new not a new concept, but at least it was not as well known as it is today. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it was indeed difficult to talk to companies and to convince them that offering dual career services actually would give them a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. So it really helps them in the global war for talent to provide added value when it is about um, talent attraction, but also talent retention. And in the last couple of years, a lot of things have changed. So dual career really got a lot of more attraction in the last years, um, also European money. So I'd say by now throughout Europe, it is pretty widespread and also amongst European universities, it is um, really well established. And that of course also provided some kind of tailwind for us then also, obviously. Mm -hmm. In general, I'd say there were not so many struggles. I think Leuven was really a good place for us to, to, to test our ideas, to put our ideas into practice. And also probably we were just at the right place in the right time because there was a lot happening at once. Also the International House, which has the same target group, obviously, really getting started on its services, then the new, new mayor. So I think that all created together a dynamic where it was kind of a, kind of a good vibe to start new ideas. Um, yeah. So that's what we really appreciated. And um, one further struggle maybe was that we had to redefine um, our clients also along the way. So as we started out, we were assuming that we would target companies hiring internationally here in Leuven and then also the individual customer. But along the way, it turned out that our, I mean, we do have one-on-one -on -one coachings, but it's not the big part of what we are doing. Mm -hmm. So our main target group now, our, our main clients are really public institutions okay. like universities, international house, an EU funded project in the border region of Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands, for example. And those public institutions usually have the financial means to pay for our services, and then they have a strategic interest to provide either dual career services or career guidance in a more general sense for the international audience, or both, sometimes mm -hmm. also both. Um, because they then really also think about town attraction, town retention, and they see that this is part of, um, yeah, place branding for a city like Leuven, um, employer branding also. Um, and then we either provide our services as a service provider for those institutions or in cooperation with those institutions and then working directly with the people who come and join our workshops or join the webinars or the trainings. Yeah, that's a super interesting journey then because you thought you were going yeah. to be you know, yeah. focused on the end yeah. user and yeah. then suddenly you have to switch lanes yeah. and that's, I guess, the fun of building your own business. It was um, a big learning also, obviously. Yeah. And I think it's great that we, we had the chance to redirect. So we were right with the topic, but it turned out differently who the main clients then are. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ah, super. Mm. And I just want to go back to my game plan because you were talking about um, showing the added value. Is that something that you struggle with? Do, do clubs, you know, immediately see the value or? No, no not at all. Mm. Depends on club to club. If a club is really like innovative, then yeah, of course you don't have to explain. But it also what what makes it difficult for us or a challenge is that you the the end user is not the one who pays. So we have to convince two parties, and sometimes it could be that the end user is convinced, but the one who has to pay or sign the contract is not. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it would be extremely powerful if you could just give an ROI that you can just say with our platform you will win more. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, football does not work like that. So what you try to give is the amount of times you saved or now they communicate their videos with two or three players at max with our platform with, with all 25 or 30 in their, in their squad. Um, so you try to give them examples on, on how we can help them. But... Yeah, sometimes it is a challenge, especially like you have to get them in one meeting at once and then try to convince them and their time is, yeah, pretty scarce because they have to do the transfers and everything. So that's a little bit the challenge we, we face in that part. Yeah. And you actually then have to, you have a double messaging at that time, as you say, because you've got to yeah. Yeah, talk to true. two different people and convince them in one meeting. Yeah. Okay, how yeah. do you <laughs> tackle that? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Uh, normally I go into a meeting with, uh, I don't know, four or five different slide decks. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I just be prepared and I just uh, look, I, I just have a, like a small conversation with them and then I know, okay, these, these guys are innovative. I need to get that slide deck or, uh, okay. ooh, they don't have a lot of money. I need to get that slide deck or yeah. I just try to do it like that. But yeah, sometimes it's a challenge, but most of the times... Um, they also they also know it from each other that you just try to convince like the end users like okay this is something we could really use and then you turn to like the decider and more talk about what's how much money is going to save and how much time the staff is going to save and and then yeah you just try to switch that in the conversation but yeah it's it's difficult because also sometimes you think something and then you turn uh, you you yeah. go to a slide deck and then it's Maybe not the right one. So okay. yeah, that sometimes happens. There's no too. way of knowing because I, I have no idea <laughs> knowing in advance whether a team is more innovative or not. Yeah, you could know because yeah, I think the the network in like if we say for example Belgian football, mm -hmm. you know it if you like know the people you've worked with once in a lifetime or you you know from like media communication like they hired two data scientists already so they okay. must be pretty innovative it works a little bit like that like you screen yeah. first before you go to a meeting and then you try to yeah try to get their interest and get them interested in your product yeah cool um going back to talent interlock very curious is there anything else that you're also planning on now to develop the future of talent interlock Mm, we always have many ideas. At the moment, we see that we increasingly also include facilitation of career events and also public speaking in our portfolio. That's something we already started in 2020, but we um, at the moment really increase that. And it's a lot of fun to, yeah, to really just bring our experience, our expertise to the table when facilitating a panel discussion or yeah, just giving a talk, basically. Yeah. Okay, I'm curious because you say you always have a lot of ideas and this is something I've also seen indeed talking to entrepreneurs. How do you decide on what idea you go through with? Gut feeling, resources, in terms of also time, try and error also sometimes, discussing with my co-founder, getting advice if we're still not sure. But, but we also did have different products and not all products always turned out um, as, as a success in the way that we keep them. So some workshop formats worked so well, we, we have them as a kind of evergreen or a standard. And then, of course, we always continuously develop them further. But we just really see that it clicks. And some was more like, OK, that's, that's not really perfect yet. So we just need to rethink it. And um, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, we, uh, what we try to do is pilot as much as we can because at the start we, we had an idea and then you just have to find partners in that can give feedback and that work with the problems day to day and can give honest feedback and yeah try to pilot and talk to as much people as possible and also see before you try to develop it see if it's scalable see if it can generate revenue in the long term because otherwise you can have something that's really nice but yeah doesn't sell yeah and yeah it could be a nice added feature on something that already exists but it's not the base of your product mm -hmm. so yeah i would agree on on um on um on what she said but um i think talking with with everyone you can who wants to talk yeah yeah <laughs> and wants to use your product just talk with them and ask for feedback yeah okay is there any other advice that you would give to people who are having problems in building their own startup or to those that might have an idea but they don't know how to jump or do that initial step <laughs> how to jump um i i think advice that's a little bit a, a broad question but is is actually the same try to try to already talk with something that you have a pilot or a first version try to make a first version like when you're still at your job and doing it in the evening after your hours and try to make like first version that you can show to someone yeah. and not yeah. just with a presentation because most of the time they don't have the same thoughts in their head as you have mm -hmm. um, then try to speak with experts um, who are in this industry for over like 20 30 years send them a message on linkedin they will <laughs> love to I don't know, talk with you and have a drink with you. Um, don't be scared to just talk to them and ask for advice. And another big advice I would give is go to Vlio and search for grants because that <laughs> can give you a little bit of, of, of yeah, freedom financially to just give you um, yeah, the freedom to, to quit your job. It was the same with us. It was like, okay, when we, when we have that amount of money, yeah, we are confident enough to just quit our jobs and start. Okay. And then we just, yeah, we got I Make I Start. We got the Vlio grant, like the Innovative Startersteun, which helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can just jump and then just go and see where it ends. What is that Vlio support or those grants? What are, what um, yeah, there are a lot of grants that you can apply for um mm -hmm. like the the iss it's called what we applied for like one year ago i think it's one times one time a year um you can pitch an id where you have to have some kind of uh, early stage yeah product already in 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 place you pitch the id and um then if you're selected with the application you get fifty thousand euros Okay. Um, but there are also like research and development grants or, or feasibility grants. Just go to the website and, and look everything out because it can be extremely powerful to, to start and, and to just go ahead and then just, you, yeah, it's also a cliche, but don't be afraid to fail, yeah. especially when you have like the age that I have, like in your 20s, it doesn't matter. I was always thinking like before I started like ah, but then I cannot save and this and for a period I wouldn't have enough money it wouldn't make a difference if I'm looking bad at this in 20 30 years or even 10 yeah I'm I've learned in the last year more than mm. yeah in whole my life I would say mm -hmm. just by doing everything yourself and, and not having like an employer who's standing above you and taking decisions yeah so yeah it would it's definitely worth the shot of trying no regrets yeah no, <laughs> super. Leah, do you have any advice that you would give other people, you know, starting out or not knowing how to start? I agree with a lot of what has already been said. I would also recommend to start with a pilot product and our products look pretty differently. So in our case, yeah. it would be a tryout workshop, which we really had. But with a pilot product, you can really maybe even have customers which who do not pay in the beginning but they give you testimonials so they really try your product in our case workshops and really give you a feedback how you can further improve but also be give you testimonials for the website and once you acquire the first client and the second and they give you 
good references and good testimonials, it's much easier to acquire the third, fourth, and fifth um, client or customer. Yeah, that's definitely one thing I would recommend. And then also, um, yeah, network. A lot of networking, that's what we have done in the beginning. We have spoken to so many people, companies um, in Leuven. At one point, we had a meeting with the mayor. So we were sitting in the office of the mayor um, presenting our idea. Mm -hmm. So um, just going out there, talking about the idea. Um, and I think it also helps if you go all in in the beginning in terms of really um, creating a brand so that you really create a website, a name, a logo, um, yeah, so that you, yet you are really getting started there all at once. Yeah. That when you're getting in touch with these people that you have something to yeah. back it up with. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Cool. Maybe something to add on that. If What, what ha helped me is if you're scared to jump or you're maybe thinking that sometimes you would give up, is try to tell as much people from your family, <laughs> friends, that you're starting with the ID. Because then it's diffi more difficult to say, yeah, I quit with it. Mm -hmm. You just have to so you trick tell, yourself. yeah, trick yeah. yourself. <laughs> tell everyone you know, yeah. and then you, when you're on the verge, because you will have it a thousand of times during your startup experience. Yeah, maybe it's not a that of good idea, or maybe when you have doubts, you will think, oh no, I told that person that yeah. that, that, that I cannot quit, <laughs> yeah. and that really helps. It, it helped me. Yeah. yeah, it pushes you, indeed. Nice. Okay. Um, but what does a day in the life or the week in the life of an entrepreneur look like for you? Oof. Um, <laughs> it looks, it's maybe also a cliche, but it looks every day is different. Yeah. And that's also the thing I love the most is some days you're, you're traveling all day and you're thinking like, I didn't do a lot, but then you meet like two, three people that can change maybe yeah. your lifetime or your lifetime of your startup. Um, but what it looks like for me, it's um, it always always starts in the morning with us. We have the the um, we always meet each other in the morning with the with the yeah the core team like the three co-founders, and um, we just talk informally, and then we just go through the day, um, and then we just um, yeah set a little bit our goals. Um, but that's for me is the important most important thing in in, in startup life is that you have like your co-founders who have the same targets, the same vision, and you will get a lot of, yeah, <laughs> breakdowns, but they're in the same boat as you are, and you just try to get to a point together, and that's a little bit how I feel of my day. I never feel like I have to do this task and this task and this task. I just feel like, okay, we're at this point, and we need to get there, yeah. and we are three young guys who just want to get to that point and try to do our best to do yeah. to get there and that's how a little bit how i see my day to day job before before when i was just working as an employee for example it really was like um yeah you had less focus it was more about getting tasks done and getting like small pieces done right now you're you're envisioning how your company would look like in 3 or 5 or 10 years mm -hmm. and you're trying to get to that point yeah. And that's a total different point of view, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, super interesting. Leah, is there anything specific about your week organization or something um, that stands out as well? I think I would probably here think about having little kids and working. So that I think you also ask about a kind of hack, like what helps you getting yeah. organized. Um, definitely a partner who's invested and who shares taking care of the kids. Mm -hmm. So especially for all female founders out there, I guess that's one of the biggest, um, biggest important things um, at that journey. Yeah. Being in it together. <laughs> Being <Yeah>. supported. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> 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 we work in the, in the KBC office because we started. We have a co-working space office. And a lot of startups around us have kids. I mean, I know they're, they're co-founders with kids. I don't have kids because I'm pretty young. Um, and I'm always thinking, like, how the hell do you do this? Yeah. <laughs> how the hell do you combine this? Yeah. And, yeah, I have so Especially much respect for... Yeah, <laughs> so much respect. I, I think I couldn't yeah. imagine 
manage what we have done with kids. Yeah. Can you even imagine it? You figure it out. Yeah, Nobody's ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can completely be ready. <laughs> well, Bethany, do you have any uh, life or business hacks um, like to organize yourself, your tasks and stuff that you can share with others? Ooh, um, hacks. Uh, there are not a lot of hacks in life, fortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what helps for me is, is to really structure my, my small tasks and really write them down mm -hmm. because the, the most difficult part, I think, of when you're a co-founder is that you're, you're everything. You're mm -hmm. the guy who does the finances. You're the guy who, who does the employer contracts. You're the guy who does the sales, the marketing. You're, you're doing everything. And, mm -hmm. and I think the, the biggest pitfall is that you lose your overview. Yeah. And when I, for myself, do not, do not write down tasks and really structure it in, in the way that's comfortable for me, I get lost in, in these small tasks and I completely get lost in the overview and then you can hit every task mm -hmm. with a check, but you, you lose your, yeah, the way you should go with your company. And I think that's, I, I think that's different for everyone, how they want to get structured. You write it down or, you, I don't know, you record or whatever, or you put it in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that helps a lot for me, like structuring every topic because you have to like, do six jobs in one yeah. and never try to lose the long-term vision of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for the rest, hacks, yeah. Drink a lot of coffee helps for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hack. Um, yeah, for the rest, I wouldn't add anything. Okay. I hope she has a lot of hacks that I can use. <laughs> I was counting on you there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say coffee. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, Elia, make sure, because also Beth will be talking about, you know, always working towards the, the bigger game plan. How do you ensure not getting lost in the details of the day-to-day -day and still working on the bigger strategy and plan? That's addition? really a topic I see as well. So I think you already described it very well. And sometimes you have so many to-dos on your to-do list that there's indeed the danger of losing the bigger picture. And... Um, so I could totally relate to what, what you were saying, and also that you're doing everything. So um, when you have your own, um, your own initiative, you really do everything. Like suddenly you're the marketing guy and the social media guy, and you're doing the website, and you're doing HR, and you're doing business development, and you're doing finance, financial stuff. And, um, and that's not even speaking, in our case, about giving a workshop, <laughs> which yeah. is actually our core product. Um, I guess here it also definitely helps me a lot that we are with two. So if you are sometimes lost in, in your own to-do list, there's always this getting back to the other one and then really talking about and that, is this really necessary? Or, oh wait, this was, but this was meant to, to help us getting there and there. So for me, it, it so helps that I'm not alone in that business, yeah. but really with two. So, and then you, <laughs> we sometimes have those strategy conversations and we are not expecting that. So sometimes through WhatsApp, then just WhatsApping <laughs> at 10 in the evening, like a long WhatsApp conversation or um, actually meeting with the families in town on a Sunday. And then suddenly this turns into like a bigger strategic conversation, which was not planned maybe for this specific afternoon. But um, yeah, definitely that you have some to talk through um, and to, to have the strategic conversation of are we still heading where we want to he head towards? So, yeah. 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 And also to add on that one, um, because most times when you start, you're pretty young, get seniors aboard. That's yeah. so important. Just people who have or failed or successfully done or founded the startup but also from, from the corporate world, just get seniors aboard and, and invite them each month or two months to your company, mm -hmm. have a drink with them, and they will, they will certainly uh, say to you, you don't have to do that, but you have to do that. Yeah. Um, or that's what, what our little board of advisors does. And I, I get so much value out of that. That's just someone who is more experienced in yeah, sales or someone who's more experienced in just working in the football industry or just uh, has successful startups, just have a drink with them and, and yeah. they're, they will be happy to, to join with you. But just ask them. It's really important to do that because, yeah, I'm 26. Yeah. What do I know? That's interesting. You've got like a formal kind of board of advisors. Yeah, I won't call it formal. Okay. 
<laughs> because it's very informal meetings. Okay. But they and how did you find them? Um, Who yeah, they? also through through network or like um, it's it's really difficult to find someone in 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 my industry in, in industry of football who knows something of working in the football industry and having knowledge of software. Okay, that's almost what I thought impossible to find. So I, uh, I recently asked the question to one of our mentors of, of I'm a guy start. And then he just said, look, I think the, the president of, of a, a club in Belgium also has a software company. Just send him a message and maybe we'll talk to you. And yesterday I went to, to, to Brugge to, to visit him and went to talk and, and I, I learned a lot because yeah, these guys have so much senior experience and, and can share it with you. But just, yes, the easiest thing, just ask to the persons you know. Yeah. Um, do you know someone? I'm looking for someone with experience with this part or this part. and Or otherwise, just yeah, search on LinkedIn and send them a message. Yeah. Don't be afraid to do that. And, and what I, how I divided it, I needed someone with a lot of experience in sales and marketing, someone just core startup experience, and then someone more like football-related industry and these are seniors that I talk once month two months with mm -hmm. and it could be really short like I have this or this issue or yeah go to accelerators like uh, two weeks ago we had a conversation with a with a possible investor and I had a lot of issues with my financial plan I just asked like the mentor of KBC he said go to this guy I called him we went to a zoom call he helped me and after two two hours it was fixed Right. So just reach out to these kinds of people. Yeah. Everyone is ready to help. Cool. Yeah, do you have any mentors or advisors helping talent at Lock? Oh, that's an interesting question. Any mentors or advisors? Not really, I would say. But that's still an interesting question. So I might take that with me and yeah. <laughs> still think about it. <laughs> All right. Um, I've got all gone through all my questions. I'm going to have a quick look um, through Discord. I can't see any questions in the chat here. I'm looking. No? No there? All right. Anybody in the audience that might have a question for us? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there then. Thank you to everyone that joined live and online. Um, the speakers, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Special thanks to Broadcaster once again for the amazingly professional technical setup that we have here and Studio Start, of course, for the location. Catch us again next month for another chat with entrepreneurs. Um, please fill in the evaluation form so we can take your feedback into consideration for the next editions. Lover Value Network is in full swing for the LIAs, the Lova Innovation Awards, where we'll celebrate Lover st startups and innovations on June the 11th at Irish Colleg College. Uh, tickets can be bought on Eventbrite. The links can be found on our website and social media, of course. Early bird tickets end this Sunday. So up until Sunday for just 22 euros, you'll get entry to the awards, dinner, open bar, and access to the after party. So I would say get your tickets before Sunday. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. <laughs>